Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. I see someone is here viewing our webinar with their guinea pig. That's exciting. <laughs> hi, guinea pig. They're one of my favorite animals, so I have to say hi. Uh, my name is Lindsay, and I'm an educator for the St. Louis Zoo. Our program title today is Animal Training at the Zoo. This is one of my favorite topics, so I'm super excited and really geeking out about this. All right, so I would like to point out, though, that the St. Louis Zoo is open and we're really excited to be welcoming everyone back. Please make your free timed reservations online or by phone and make sure you bring your mask with you. Those are required um, and we'll want to maintain our safe social distancing of an alpaca's length apart or about six feet. All right, so let's get started. Animal training at the zoo. Woo -hoo, here's some cool pictures. All right, so it is National Zookeeper Week and we are celebrating at the zoo and from our homes, which I forgot to mention earlier, my mask is not around my mouth right now because I'm not at the St. Louis Zoo. I am presenting the webinar from my home, so I have mine lowered and there's no one sharing space with me either. So I have it ready to go if I need it, but it's down here for now. And it's got exciting animal uh, tracks on it today. It makes me excited to wear mine because animal tracks are awesome. All right, so a day in the life of a zookeeper. We're celebrating this uh, them this week. So cleaning, when we think of zookeepers, we often think of the cleaning that they do. You can uh, see them cleaning in some of these images. It's pretty cool. But also feeding, feeding is something we think about when we think about zookeepers. So they do a lot of that, spend a lot of their day preparing food and making sure that it gets to the animals it needs to go to. But also record keeping. Have you thought about record keeping before? That's an important part of their day to make sure that we document and write down important things about the animals they're caring for. But also enrichment. Every day our animals receive enrichment and those are things added to an animal's life to help them exhibit natural behaviors, things that they would naturally do. And part of that enrichment will be training. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So some other examples of enrichment are in these images here. We have one of our sloths. I'm not sure if that is an old picture or if that's actually Blondie, but we have our color, our Kelly, our polar bear. Words are hard on Fridays. <laughs> and our tortoises and one of our birds with a paper mache egg. So some of this enrichment is food treats. Some of it is a fun toy to play with or a puzzle where they can figure out how to get to things and items that they like, or even the paper mache that they can peck and rip up and destroy. So enrichment is always safe, but a type of enrichment we often forget about as people in the public <laughs> is training. So zookeepers will work with their animals to teach them behaviors. But it's important to note that animals are always willing participants in doing the natural behaviors that are being asked of them by their keepers. So our animals always have a choice whether they want to participate or not. But why train animals? Why would we do that with them? Because it allows animals to receive the best care possible and with their own participation. Remember, they're choosing willingly to participate in a training session so they can help in their own care. And it allows zookeepers and our animal health care team to do their jobs more safely and easily. And it provides enrichment to the animals' lives. It's fun. If training isn't fun, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> All right, again, why train animals? Here are some more exact examples. So scales, when you hop on a scale, you're checking your weight. Well, our animals, we need to make sure that their weight is okay. So maybe an animal needs to lose some weight. You can check that by having them get on a scale. What if they need to gain weight? Maybe they're going to have a baby and we need to make sure that they're growing and gaining weight. You can do that with a scale. So animals though, we can't get inside of their habitat with them and just shove them onto a scale, nor would we want to do that to them. That's not very friendly or kind. And a lot of times an animal might be way too large to do that even if it was all right. So if we can willingly ask an animal, hey, move on to the scale and they do it, awesome. It's easier all around and safer for everyone. Also radiographs or x-rays. What if an animal might be injured? 
we can willingly, or they can willingly move into an area to get an x-ray. Also, needles, ooh, many of us don't enjoy going to get a needle stuck in them for a vaccine to prevent an illness, or if you're getting your blood drawn so that you can look at your, or the doctor can look at your blood to make sure that you're healthy. Well, animals can learn over time to accept a needle being put into their arm or their neck. Also, this weight is to symbolize exercise or to move your muscles. So some animals might need a little extra help getting some exercise or moving their muscles in certain ways. What about physical therapy? If you've heard of that for humans, some animals might need some of that. Well, with training, we can help them do that. Rubik's cube, if you've seen these before, this is symbolizing our brains. So animals, their brains. We can use training to help them have fun solving puzzles or figuring out how to do something. And this is a student in their chair because education, training can help educate people about animals and help with conservation. So if you've been to one of our animal shows like the sea lion show or our shows in the children's zoo, those are helping teach people about animals and the animals are having fun while they're doing it. So, we're training animals, but how do we do that? Zookeepers at the St. Louis Zoo use positive reinforcement training, but let's learn what that means exactly. It might be a little confusing and that's okay. All right, this is when Lindsay starts to really geek out. This is one of my favorite topics ever, but I'm gonna keep this brief. It's gonna be fun, I promise. We're not gonna go into a lot of details because this is just a 20 minute webinar today. So if any of this sounds really fun and exciting to you, please do some research on your own and let's get started. So two types of learning that we'll talk about really quickly today is classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Operant conditioning, has positive reinforcement as part of that learning. So that's what we do at the St. Louis Zoo. Now, classical conditioning. This works for involuntary behavior or behavior that an animal or you don't have any choice in the matter. So if you think of us as animals as well, we're mammals. All of this works on people too. So once you learn how to do this, you, you can do it to your friends and family. <laughs> so. This is for behavior that you don't have a choice in the matter. The prime example of this is Pavlov's dog. Pavlov was a person. Um, we can also call this Pavlonian conditioning. So this example really quickly is of a dog and he's drooling because he sees some meat that looks really tasty to him. Now this dog also could hear a bell ringing, but he doesn't drool because it's just a bell ringing, right? Well, if you pair that bell ringing with the meat, over time, that dog will learn that a bell ringing means that that steak is coming and the drooling will occur when they only hear the bell. Awesome. So the drooling happens and then they get, and then the meat shows up. All right. Operant conditioning, though. This is really what we want to look at. So this happens with voluntary behavior. So when an animal has a choice. So what happens after a behavior determines the chances of that behavior being repeated. So behavior happening more or happening less. So instead of it happening beforehand, this happens after the behavior. All right, I know this, this looks crazy scary and it's a little bit of math, but we're gonna breeze through it really quick. Again, if this looks really interesting to you, look up operant conditioning quadrant. Now, a lot of you should have begun learning about math quadrants like this. Um, so it shouldn't look too unfamiliar to you. So if you look at this side on the left where my arrow is, those are the letter R. And R stands for reinforce. And that means we want to increase the behavior. We want that behavior to happen more. Now over on this side, the right-hand side of this cube, where my arrow is, there are P's. Now the P's stand for punish, or you want to decrease a behavior. You want it to happen less. And on the top here where my arrow is, you see plus symbols, and those stand for positive. But really, it doesn't mean positive like good or bad. It means positive adding, like in math. So it means you're adding something to that animal's environment you're giving them something. 
and the negative symbols down here, same thing, you're subtracting. So you're taking something away. At the St. Louis Zoo, we stay in that top box right there, R plus, that is positive reinforcement. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> And all the behaviors that you need to teach animals to do or you would like them to learn can be taught using just that square. And according to science and behavior, that is the box you want to stay in whenever you can. And a lot of scientists believe that we should always stay in that corner and never veer to the other ones. So at the St. Louis Zoo, that's what we do. We stay right in that corner there. All right, so positive reinforcement training. A behavior happens. We'll use dogs as an example because that's something that people have a lot of familiarity with. So a dog, maybe you ask your dog to sit. So this dog is sitting. Oh, here's a new word. So a bridge. If you can see me in your screen here, I'm holding a clicker right here and that's what the picture is of a clicker. And when you press on the button, it clicks. Now that sound is consistent. Every single time I click, it's the same clicking sound. If I'm really excited or if I'm really sad, it still clicks just the same. So this bridge happens right when that animal does a sit. So when the animal sits, get a click, or some trainers will use a whistle or even their voice. They may say yes or good, but every single time it will be exactly the same. Now, after that bridge happens, guess what? They get reinforced for it or you could think of it as a reward. So the dog in the picture here is getting a Kong toy that has peanut butter inside of it. So what do you think happens then? Does that behavior happen more? Yeah, so our behavior is gonna happen again and again because that dog really likes peanut butter and he might really like that Kong toy too. So he learns that, hey, when I sit down, I get this peanut butter treat. Awesome, I'm gonna keep doing these sitting because I get, I get things I like after I do it. And that's how we train animals at the zoo. And you can teach everything that way. So when this animal sits, immediately as they sit down, they get a click or a whistle or a good. And that needs to happen right as the behavior happens that you like. And then very quickly, they get their treat. Now, what's interesting is that the bridge, so your whistle, your clicker, what have you, needs to be loaded or charged first. And that is actually done using classical conditioning. Remember the bell that made the dog drool? It's the same thing. The clicker means, ooh, something I really like is coming very quickly. I just need to be patient for a minute. Because sometimes an animal like a sea lion might be doing a big jump in the water way over there and you can't get food or something it likes, like a fish, to it fast enough. So if they whistle, that animal knows, ooh, my re reinforcement or my reward is coming really soon. So you're reinforcing to increase a behavior. Now, animal trainers are patient. They are consistent. And they are good at solving problems. They know animal behavior. They are calm. They are dedicated and they are persistent. Now, training for health exams is an example we use a lot for why we train animals. Because if you look at the image, this harbor seal is offering up its flipper to its trainer willingly. So the trainer can then check their flipper for any health conditions, make sure it's safe, make sure that they can lift their flipper properly, and we can make sure that our animals in our care are happy and healthy. Now, the other animal is a little owl, and he's having his eyes looked at. Now, that animal has been trained to accept being held and not be stressed out by it. Now, I have a fun video that I'd like to show you. This is our sea lion, Dixie, and she's going to get her teeth brushed. Have you ever brushed the teeth of your pet at home? Maybe, maybe not. It's an important thing to do for their care. Now, with positive reinforcement training, we can help them get used to having their teeth brushed. Let's watch this video.
thing. So if you notice Dixie, when her trainer asked her for a behavior, if she did the behavior she was asking her to do, then the, the trainer would mark that behavior quickly and say, good. And then what happened? She got her reinforcement, which was a big old fish. Super exciting. So training for health exams. Here are some really fun images. This is a very young Speaks gazelle and it's having its eye looked at. One of our fennec foxes on a scale. So getting their weight checked and one of our dwarf mongooses getting his weight checked. But our behaviors will be shaped. So you could capture a behavior. Say if you saw a sea lion doing a really um, cool spin in the water, you could capture that behavior. You're not actually grabbing it and capturing it, but it's called capturing because you would, um, you know, give a click or a whistle or a good when they do it um, to try to capture that behavior and have them repeat it again. But if you want to shape a behavior, you might use targeting and you'll do that using small steps to give them lots of chances to be reinforced or be rewarded for that. It sets you up for success. It sets our animals up for success. So targeting, if you see our trainers with a big long pole that has a ball on the end of it, that is not used to hurt our animals in any way. That targeting pole is used to show them where to go. So the animals know to touch their nose or a body part to the end of that pole and then we can use it. Maybe we want the animal to spin. So you could move that target and then the animal will follow it. So this is a really fun video. So let's watch this to show us how zookeepers will shape important behaviors using small steps. Now, I think it would be pretty exciting if our pets at home would allow us to do a blood draw on them at their vet exam willingly without having to be restrained in any way. It's pretty cool. And those are things that we do at the St. Louis Zoo so that our animals aren't stressed. And it's also safer for us and them. So shifting is another thing that's important for our animals to learn. You can also think of training as teaching and conditioning as learning. So when we're training animals, we're just teaching them. So animals, when they shift, they are reinforced for going to different parts of their home. Now, why would they need to do that? Now, our polar bear, Cully, our keepers can't share space with him. It's not safe and he might not enjoy it. So when we need to put things in his home or clean up after him, he'll need to move to another area. And with training, we can teach him to do that. In these images, you can see a keeper in one area of the primate house and some animals in a different space. So our training with Cully the polar bear is something I would like to show you. This is when he was five years old and it's a great example of training at the St. Louis Zoo. Target. Good. So 
Cully's getting chunks of herring today and blocks of lard. Two of his diet items and two that he really enjoys. We like to use positive reinforcement training here at the St. Louis Zoo. And that means that when uh, he does the behavior that we ask him to do, he gets reinforced to, so he gets a treat, the lard and the fish. Uh, so today we were working on target. It basically just means that he touches his nose to the end of a target stick. And that helps us to build on other behaviors. It can get us to help him move where we need him to go if we're training him for a veterinary procedure or something like that. The other behavior we worked on today was lay down. Basically, it's asking him to lay down on his belly with his paws out flat. And again, all of these behaviors just help us to take better care of him. They help him to participate in his care. Um, if the veterinarians need to examine a part of his body, so he'll show us his paws, he'll open his mouth, stand up on his hind legs and show off his belly. Good. Um, so we also gave Cully a little bit of browse. Um, this type of browse was bamboo. He will eat some of the leaves if he wants to, but he um, more likely will just play with it and sort of manipulate it. Um, he can kind of use his big old teeth to crack it open or his uh, paws to snap it. Um, we would never share space with him. So as close as we ever get to him is what you saw us doing here at the interactive walls. We always have that steel mesh in between us and the bear. So no, we do not open the interactive walls at the same time every day. We typically do it maybe twice a week and it's always at varying times. And that's because we don't want Kali predicting when he's going to be fed. Um, he's never fed at the same time each day. We typically feed him between five and ten times a day um, from varying locations, um, using different enrichment items. After we're done with our training session at the interactive wall, we'll lead him away with an enrichment item and today's enrichment item was a femur bone, so a you know beef knuckle bone. Um, he has to kind of practice to dive down there and sink in that salt water and go after the bone and obviously he has to swim and haul himself out of there and so it's good exercise for him. I think those videos were really great examples of targeting and shaping and also the types of reinforcement that our animals look at. So our Matchy's tree kangaroo years ago when she had a little joey, we want to make sure our young animals are healthy and happy and we can use training to accomplish that. So our mom tree kangaroo the trainers have really good relationship with her. And if we didn't have that using training ahead of time, she might not let us take a look at her baby. So having that relationship there and doing those training sessions allow us to monitor our young animals. So we're gonna watch a video of our black rhinoceros, Moyo. This is when he was only one week old. Now he is about three years old.
all of those videos can be found on STL Zoo's YouTube channel if you would like to look up more. And there are other videos as well. So have you started teaching or training your pets at home? And make sure if you do, you have fun. Training or teaching animals should be fun. And I'm going to check the Q&A. Oh, so why do they brush their teeth and then get them dirty again? That's a question. Yeah. So when you, you know, brush your teeth or so when we brush our teeth at night, let's say we'll go to bed then and not eat anything to make sure they're good and clean. But the act of brushing will still get off and help remove tartar or other particles on your teeth that are there and might cause damage. Um, also inspecting their mouth is a good behavior to get them used to so that if they need a dental exam, they're used to having foreign objects inside of their mouth. So sometimes it's not even about the act of brushing their teeth. Um, you know, a toothbrush is a new object. It's something inside of your mouth. So there's lots of reasons for that. But yeah, you know, as soon as they get their tooth, teeth brushed, they'll get food as a reinforcer. So yeah, their teeth are getting dirty again. I acknowledge that it does seem a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, so how much natural foraging do the animals do at the zoo? Lots, and that will be part of their enrichment too. Maybe someday they aren't naturally able to do as much foraging in their home, maybe due to weather, maybe there isn't as much grass that day if it's an animal that likes to have grass in their home. So the keepers will enrich their habitat with more foraging opportunities, depending on the animal and what they need. So yeah, I had a lot of fun today. Thank you guys so much. Have fun training your animals at home and we'll see you at the St. Louis Zoo. Remember to bring your mask. Bye everyone.